Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you uh, have questions as I go. I'm going to review sort of the basics of mobility law. I realize everybody's not a lawyer here, so uh, uh, some of the definitions can get a little labyrinthine and difficult. Um, slow me down if I'm talking in too many acronyms and ask me to explain. Uh, I'm used to more of a legal audience than I am a lay audience, so uh, forgive me for being a lawyer uh, less than a, and, and not a public speaker uh, uh, for a wider audience. Uh, I try, but I don't always succeed. Uh, Chris's paranoia is uh, 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 well-founded, I, I have to say. Although I, I love Boston. I got a ride from the airport last night with a cab driver who asked me what I was doing here, and I said I was coming to, to speak to the Berkman Center about uh, mobility and location law. And he said, you know, that's really interesting, but I don't know why anybody cares about that because I know we all have chips implanted when we're born and everybody's tracking us anyway. So just so you know, you can be a cab driver after this job and probably make more money at it too, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when he put the foil hat on, I really knew he was absolutely serious. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple of, of uh, topics because we don't have a lot of time to get, get really too deep into the weeds here, but uh, I'm going to focus mostly on location technology, but it does overlap more with surveillance law in general and some constitutional law, uh, Fourth Amendment issues. Uh, I'm going to try to level set us on the technology so we have a common uh, lexicon when we talk about mobility and location information give you a little bit of background on the history and how we got to where we are in the current debate and then give you some perspective on the future, uh, at least as I see it, on, on where law is going uh, with location. Uh, I have a sort of a unique perch. Um, I started representing Macaw Cellular in the early 90s, one of the very first cell phone uh, uh, providers. and. Uh, there's an old adage in baseball, if you're fond of Field of Dreams, it's called, uh, and Craig McCaw was fond of quoting this, if you build it, they will come. And uh, the surprise was the they uh, wasn't the customer, it was the criminal. So the first customers they had were the people who were stealing service, and in some markets it was as much as 70% of the carriage was due to fraud. And this is the old analog world where cell phones had no security built in, where you could easily, with a Bearcat scanner and Timson software, you, you know, somebody's shaking their head because they have this on their laptop right now. <laughs> you could just scan that information. Not as useful. Yeah, not as useful. And you could reprogram a phone and you could clone it basically and pretend to be somebody else. And uh, a lot of our early efforts uh, at, at the company were, were dedicated towards combating that kind of, of fraud. So we would go out and we would uh, look for call cell operations, which basically was somebody standing on a corner who had cloned a phone and was selling service to make long distance calls to foreign countries for five bucks a minute to some poor guy who wanted to walk up and didn't, didn't have a phone of their own. And that was huge business, and uh, it was obviously huge revenue loss, and so we developed tools to find them. We drive around lower Manhattan with a cell site analyzer on top of a van and look for these operations, triangulate the signals, and pull up, call the police, and have them arrested. The second day that would show up, once they understood the capabilities we had, were all the three-letter agencies who wanted to learn the same techniques and indeed employed those same techniques. So if, if all of you remember who Kevin Mitnick is, a uh, famous hacker, he was actually caught through location-aware technology. Uh, he had a wireless modem he was using to uh, hack into carrier switches and make his uh, long-distance phone calls and Internet access and do his hacking through that wireless modem. He was tracked with the cooperation of a carrier in the FBI uh, uh, to, to the place where he ultimately was arrested using a, a trigger fish device, which is uh, a, a device that measures the, uh, assists in measuring the various signals from uh, multiple points in a cellular network. And uh, much like a divining rod looking for water, you can zero in on where the signal is coming from, from the handset or wireless modem. And so all of this was really the, the infancy of location-aware technology for surveillance in, in the 1990s. 
Well, those capabilities coupled with the migration in the cellular networks from analog to digital uh, put law enforcement at a real disadvantage. They didn't have the capabilities. We did. They wanted them. We said no because it cost too much money to build in that kind of capability. So in 1994, they went to Congress and demanded that Congress pass a law. It actually was 1993 was the first attempt. But in 1994, they succeeded in passing the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, which for the first time ever required carriers, not just wireless, but all carriers, to bake in to their uh, uh, equipment surveillance-capable technology so that no longer would you need uh, a pair of alligator clips and the line outside the target's home to climb up the telephone pole and hook those alligator clips up or to go down into the basement of the building uh, in the tried and true method that as far back as, as the phone was invented, law enforcement used. You could now do it all out of the central office of a carrier with the flip of a switch. So you send an order in and say we need to wiretap individual X and you will automatically provide us the content of that communication and the call identifying information about that particular uh, call. Um, in those debates, one of the serious privacy issues raised in the testimony before Congress was whether or not the government sought to have tracking capability for wireless phones included. And FBI Director Louis Free submitted his written statements saying, uh, in, in no way, shape, or form does the government want tracking. It is a privacy red herring being you know, promulgated by a bunch of paranoid zealots. Looking at Chris. <laughs> <coughs> and the statutory structure at the time and the compromises made by law enforcement in getting the legislation passed seem to support that conclusion. First, in CALEA, we separated <coughs> basic subscriber information that the government could get on a mere subpoena, your name, your address, uh, how long you had the service and the types of service you had, from other network information like location information, which tower was serving your call. We put them into two different buckets, and for the first one, the basic stuff, we said all law enforcement had to do was come to you with a grand jury subpoena, which you know, you know, is like ordering a ham sandwich at a lunch bar. You simply walk in, ask the clerk for a subpoena, and you go out and you serve it. No judicial review. And instead, for this other category, which included location, we said, you need an independent judge to review that that information is needed. And the standard the judge will go by is a higher standard than a mere pen register. The standard will be specific and articulable facts that the information is relevant to an ongoing investigation. Judge has to make an independent determination based on an affidavit from the requesting officer. And then in the second part of CALEA, we said, uh, that location information will not be available solely on a pen register order. And that word solely is important in the statute. A pen register is the dialing and signaling of you making a phone call. So when I dial uh, your phone number, each one of those pulses can be captured with a pen register in real time, automatically, on a standard that is very, that is really low. Uh, a magistrate must a magistrate shall issue a pen register order when the requesting officer shows it's material to an investigation. Arguably, no discretion. The judge simply issues the order, tells the carrier, put the pen register up. So coming out of CALEA, there was a general sense that location information was uh, not covered prospectively for real-time surveillance. Now, uh, all of that is, is uh, uh, interesting language and sort of loaded. I have a lot of terms in there, so I want to break it down into kind of the network information. Um, when I talk about location information in the network, uh, there are a number of various sources for that information. Every time 
you put your phone on. Right now, if your cell phone is on, it's registering on a tower. And that tower is in the carrier's back end authenticating you as a user. It's saying you're a legitimate customer who can use my system, and I know where you are in order to route and deliver the phone call. That's recorded automatically. Now, you're not making a call. I just know and record your availability on a particular cell tower. Uh, that information generally is ephemeral. It's only stored for a short period of time in the carrier's home location register. Now I make a phone call. Is because of the history of how carrier networks were created and licenses granted, the location information, the tower handling your call, was automatically recorded at the beginning and end of that call. Why? Because not that I'm dating myself here, but in the early days of cell phones when they were bricks, you only had local service and you were roaming in other carriers' networks and there was compensation paid uh, in order to be carried. And so to figure that out, they registered you on a particular tower and looked at that information to determine who paid who what. So historically, as part of the call record of every call you made, we kept location information in the system. So that's still there, and it's still recorded. What's more, because systems for billing uh, are subject to disaster and, diff and problems in, in either a, a local level or, or a national disaster, carriers back up their switches uh, every day. And so the raw data, which includes the registration information on the tower, is stored for whatever the disaster recovery plan is for the carrier. Some it's sh shorter, some it could be indefinite. Now that's... You mean the information of every phone that's on simply the tower's awareness that that phone is there and can potentially route traffic to? The call detail information. Okay. So okay. when a call is made, location associated with the call. <clears throat> so that information stays uh, uh, historically. Uh, there's a second component outside what I'll just I'll call that network information, and that's the information carriers have developed for purposes of 911 service. Many carriers have GPS capability built into their systems. That GPS is not part of their network infrastructure, and um, as a result of GPS being built into phones, does everybody know what GPS is, right? They have a pretty good sense of it. Uh, as a result of that being built into phones, now third-party providers have come along and leveraged that information to make location-based services aware. If you're a Google Maps user, you can just call up the map and it tells you where you are. That's because when you downloaded that and you inquired uh, for a map, the uh, coordinates of where you were located is captured by Google along with a cell ID that's serving you. So Google makes a database of all of that information. This is all well described in, in how uh, mobility works at Google Maps. You can just read this if you care to know more technical detail. So now we have a third party who has uh, all of this, his, this historical information. And of course, uh, Google is not retaining logs of that, but nothing prevents a third party application uh, provider from doing that. So there is a historical a collection of location information that's available from various resources within carriers and third-party application providers. Then there's a second set of data that I would describe as real-time data. And that simply is the fact that I know you're on, you're present, I know what tower is serving you, and even if you're not making a call, I can initiate a ping to your phone if I'm a carrier or a third-party application provider and know where you are precisely. So a one-time method of determining your present and where you are. And then there's a third category that I would describe as prospective, and that is, is the, the uh, aggregate mapping of your movements. And uh, you see this, uh, many Department of Transportations are experimenting with this to determine speed and direction on highways using cell phones as probes. So I can map where you are and where you're going over a period of time. So three categories. Now back to Kalia. Kalia only dealt, arguably, 
with the historical aspect of that. Louis Free said, no tracking, not what we're interested in, but the historical record arguably was something that could be gotten as transactional information under uh, uh, the modification of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that I described. For lawyers, that's 18 U.S.C. 2703 is the section. Um, so what do we do about prospective and real time? Uh, out of CALEA, carriers had to develop a standardized means of delivering the surveillance information. Congress said you can collectively as an industry get together and develop how you're going to deliver location and other information for surveillance. And if you comply with that, the government can't sue you for failing to meet CALEA's requirements. So industry convened a uh, what turned out to be a four-year standards development process where all of the manufacturers and carriers got together with law enforcement to create uh, a standard for delivery. And it's important for law enforcement because they had to buy collection equipment to receive all of that incoming stuff. And so you want what's sending and receiving, obviously, to talk to each other. Location information was a major debate in that uh, process. For four years, we sat there. We had law enforcement, and uh, one, one occasion, uh, I'll never forget, pull out a weapon, slam it on the desk, and said, you're aiding terrorists if you don't give us this prospectively. And we said, you're entitled to it retrospectively. You're not entitled to it prospectively. We didn't view CALEA as requiring us to track. In fact, we thought that's what the FBI said you didn't need or you didn't want. Um, ultimately, that dis case, uh, the standard was challenged both by law enforcement and by privacy groups. And in 2000, the court determined that the way the industry handled location was proper, although it didn't articulate what standard was necessary to obtain location. So what do I mean by that? Here's what we did in the compromise in the standard setting process. We agreed that location would be given at the beginning and end of a call as a conditional parameter in the message set for surveillance sent to law enforcement on a pen register, provided the government met the proper legal standard. So if they came to us with the right type of order, you would flip a switch and out would go location information as part of the pen register at the beginning and end of a call. Nothing else, not registration, not prospective tracking, only location when the person was making a call at the beginning and end of that call. Notice I said not in between, because if a person is talking and they go through multiple cell sites and stuff, we weren't going to give them a map, a tracking map either. The court said that's fine. Uh, that's the appropriate standard that the signaling information, uh, obviously under the way CALEA was written, was intended to be provided to them as part of that calling information but the court punted on what the appropriate legal standard was. Thank you, we know where you are, who you are. <laughs> and if you don't, I'll just flip the switch so we can listen to the call. It is being recorded. <laughs> uh, it's, in, it's in your bag. Uh. Yeah. All right, so where do we end up? We end up with a system of delivering location baked into the wireless carrier's network, but uncertainty about what legal standard is required to force its disclosure. We uh, uh, immediately started receiving orders from uh, federal agencies as part of the pen register request. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen an order, uh, it's, it's nothing magical. It basically says carriers providing service to this customer shall provide a pen register, and then they'll list other information uh, in the order. It's, it's it, as I said, nothing magical. It's a form. Yep. Yes, pause me. Is the, um, the standard that you would give, give location at the beginning and end of the call, is that interpretation of the text in CALEA or – Something else is that? Yes. So it, it, there is language in CALEA that points towards this, if not explicitly. My question is, how explicit was CALEA about this standard? 
So the standard was to be developed by industry to meet the assistance capabilities of CALEA. The assistance capabilities really are twofold. They're really four, but only two really matter here. The ability to intercept the content of a communication and at the same time or immediately thereafter, the call identifying information that explains the incoming, outgoing, direction, and redirection of a call. So essentially the routing of a call. That set of language, those four elements were greatly disputed in terms of what they mean. And in terms of attributes for an engineer to put into a message set, it was call start, message origination, the number it was coming from, the number it was going to, if it was interrupted for a reason like a hang up, if it was routed and forwarded to another call station, call forwarding, call termination, and these various elements. The location piece of that was not articulated very clearly in the statute, but the compromise developed by the engineers and law enforcement after four years of fighting was essentially will include it as conditional in the standard. So lots of fight about that and lots of hard feelings about that, as you might imagine, in the room. The court ultimately upheld that. And actually I think it's the right answer. What identifies a call and its beginning and end includes the network node handling that call. And I think that's a fair interpretation. And nobody was willing to go to the Supreme Court on that issue. Okay? So immediately after the passage of the standard, law enforcement started coming to carriers with pen register orders, and carriers started saying, well, there was this other provision in CALEA that said you may not get location solely on a pen register. And so the pen register orders were rejected by the carriers, and law enforcement went to the Department of Justice, and ultimately they concluded that that's right. There needed to be an additional authorization, some other statutory provision that permitted it. And so they looked in the Stored Communications Act. If you remember, the second part of CALEA I mentioned is that the Stored Communications Act was divided into two buckets, basic subscriber and then the other information, which included cell site information. And law enforcement said, well, there it is. That's where our statutory grant comes from. So we'll include the magic words of Section 2703 in the pen register order. So it won't be solely pursuant to a pen register. It will be pursuant to these two provisions in the law. The only problem is that provision is about stored records, things that already exist that are historical, as opposed to that we would be creating in the future and reporting in real time. The structure of the law says if you follow a court's order, you have immunity as a provider. The providers were really not willing to take law enforcement on over that formulation. So orders routinely would come in saying 2703 plus pen register statute equals prospective location information. And it wasn't really until two years ago, almost three years ago, that a federal magistrate in New York finally looked at these orders and said, I have a real problem with this. I don't understand this prospective cell site stuff you're putting in here. And it looks to me like this is really a Fourth Amendment search and seizure probable cause issue. If you want to know where somebody's going, I just don't see the authority of the statute for that. How are you getting there? And that opinion started a magistrate's revolt across the country. Magistrate after magistrate has analyzed this issue now. And the government's only won two of these cases, and about 30 have gone against them. And here's the reasoning, and I hesitate to get too legally technical about this, 
but I have to say, on both sides of this equation, uh, it is an Ipsy Dixit outcome. Uh, both sides have figured out where they wanted to go, both the privacy and, and the uh, law enforcement community, and have fashioned arguments around statutes that personally I don't think were ever intended to cover the prospective acquisition of location information. The magistrate that wanted to quash these requests for prospective information analyzed it this way. They said in 1986, when Congress passed the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, they amended the definition of an electronic communication or to exclude information collected from a mobile tracking device. Now why was that? Why would we have a separate statute that required probable cause or the then what existed in the, in the ordinary course was to get a probable cause warrant to track a bug that you'd attach to a car or to a box where you wanted to trace somebody going down a public highway. And, and I'm not going to go into the case history of that, but everybody is familiar with the notion of putting a bug on something and following it through GPS. That's how they traditionally did it and thought about it. And in 1986, by excluding that from the definition of an electronic communication, we did what for law enforcement? We avoided them having to get a wiretap order to obtain the electronic communication because they can't intercept an electronic communication without going through very severe hoops that are very difficult to do. And besides, we're tracing something in the public. A car driving down the highway, what privacy expectation can you have in the public? And that was the thinking that went into this language to exclude from signaling location information derived from a mobile tracking device. So the magistrates looked at that and said, gee, under CALEA, I can't imagine how you would uh, be able to treat tracking information as a record of an electronic communication because it's specifically outside the definition of it. And so consequently, 2703 doesn't apply, and that's not the other authority Congress had in mind when they said you couldn't get it solely pursuant to a pen register. They must have had something else in mind. And what I think they had in mind was Rule 41 of the Criminal Rules of Procedure, which says get a probable cause warrant if you want to track something. And that's what we think you should do. So those magistrates now are the vast majority of decisions. The government forum shops. <laughs> they look for a magistrate they know is leaning their way when they want it because one magistrate's decision is not binding on another magistrate's decision in the, uh, uh, in the district. Uh, how do I know that? Well, uh, apart from case authority which says that, I know that firsthand because when Judge Smith in uh, the district court in Texas issued his famous decision on this, which really was the first thorough articulation of, of the magistrate's revolt, the magistrate sitting in the room next to him issued a prospective tracking order, which we objected to, and uh, moved to quash. And the judge, in very simple terms, and I won't give the name of the judge, said, uh, this hearing will be short. Do you wish to go to jail, or do you wish to implement the order? Easy answer. I'm sitting here today, <laughs> and the order was implemented. So you see, one magistrate's decision doesn't bind another, and we have uh, inconsistent application of this now across the country. Add to that the state authorities. The states, likewise, do surveillance. CALEA and the Electronic Communications Privacy Act is the floor, and they can't have standards less than that. But what happens when one magistrate in one state says one thing and another magistrate says another, and the state disagrees with the one that isn't favorable to its law enforcement, which magistrate do you follow for state requests? Well, the answer is the same. Whichever judge is going to put you in jail, you follow their order. And that's really where we are on, on, on state law. So uh, this debate uh, continues to rage. We don't know what the outcome will be other than the fact that everybody needs certainty. And so we know uh, looking forward, that legislation uh, is on its way. The Department of Justice wants to change and get a clear standard. Guess which standard they want? 
They want the lower standard, specific and articulable facts. And at least that's independent judicial review, right? I mean, at least that is a judge looking at the basic facts and making a decision whether it's relevant. Uh, carriers, uh, uh, privacy groups on the other side, of course, believe anything prospective should require a probable cause standard. Now, it's very difficult for law enforcement to obtain this information on a probable cause standard because of the delays that are inherent in the process of getting uh, a warrant issued. And oftentimes, this is critical in their investigations to get it very quickly, uh, and, and I, I appreciate that. But nonetheless, the privacy implications are huge. And let me explain a couple of examples of where it comes in. Uh, the types of orders we see on a routine basis are all individuals registered on a cell site during a 10-minute period. If I'm looking for witnesses who observed a particular drug transaction or a murder or something else, I ask for all of those individuals on a cell site. And under today's standard, it appears they can easily get that information. Uh, even what is a historical record is subject to some dispute over when uh, uh, you can get location information because if I'm only storing it as soon as it hits the server, uh, how long does it have to be stored before it can be obtained on a lower standard? And you know, it's the cosmic equivalent of when life begins is how long storage must be. And that's a really open question. Now, what if I ask for that stored stuff every five minutes? We used to call this the poor man's pen register because I go ask for call records every five minutes and, uh, and determine when those calls were made. And it's the poor man's pen register, same for location. So do we need a standard that's a higher standard looking at historical records? Now, when I ask, and this is, uh, uh, I won't say a common occurrence, but it is an occurrence, when law enforcement asks for the historical records on 15 individuals, and then compares and maps those individuals on the location basis to determine their proximity to each other during a particular event. You really start to develop a map, if you will, of, of your life this way. Now, for third-party providers who are not communications providers at all, what standard applies to them? If they aren't an electronic communications service to the public, they're not covered by any of this. And so is that a mere subpoena for information in their hands, like Google Maps? Now, many of you may have seen last week that Google, like Looped, a social networking application for mobility, declared that when one user dis determines it to send their location to another user so they know where they are, they treat that as content, not location information, a communication. I'm here. Here I am. Come and find me. And they will only respond to a search warrant or, or a Title III request in real time for that, for a wiretap. So service providers are pushing back on a privacy perspective, and they are not generally logging this information. Now, for civil purposes, for their applications and other uh, uh, uses uh, in location-based services, nothing prevents them from doing it. And there may well be services where you'd want to know family finder for your child. If you want to know they're in school and you want a record of where they've been and you as the parent decides to do that and you decide to keep the record, now all of a sudden we develop a location history. And then what standard do we get that under? The legislation has to address that. How about transparency? Future, future legislation should articulate how many such requests are being made. In my personal experience, it's about 100 a week at the major carriers, 100 a week. So thousands a year requesting location. There is no report on that like we get for wiretaps where we know how many wiretaps have been requested. And that 100, that each of those requests can be <coughs> for everyone in, everyone in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. that's, not 10, that's not 100 people, it's 100 requests. That's right. And that request can include multiple individuals as well. So it could be 10 <laughs> phones, 100 phones. Uh, so, so the volume of, of requests is enormous. How long must that order be implemented? Typically, uh, because if law enforcement's hybrid theory of the Stored Communications Act and the Pen Register Act combined, uh, many of them have them run the same duration. So a pen register can be 60 days, so location tracking for 60 days. 
But there is no statute that sends that says that. So how long are we willing to track them? At what periodicity? It's one thing to say at the beginning and end of a call only, but what about intermittently? How about every 10 minutes? Uh, you know, I have a great anecdote, um, in, in with two minutes left, I'll tell you. Uh, because you can disclose location on an emergency basis when uh, life or limb is at risk without legal process, it shouldn't be surprising that law enforcement has gamed that system. And they know in emergency cases that if they call up and say, someone's at risk, somebody's going to die, no carrier is going to withhold that information. We do it all the time, and it's the right thing to do because carriers are not in the position of second guessing. But if we had reporting on those requests and oversight of those requests, we'd know which ones were and were not legitimate. Uh, an incoming request for location on a missing child, a teenager, a teenage girl, and they demand that the phone be pinged every 15 minutes. That takes a person to sit there and manually ping a phone every 15 minutes. That uh, uh, request went on uh, for 24 hours. That's a lot of pings. When the uh, carrier complained about that, the law enforcement agent did the typical thing, and this was a state agency, you're going to jail if you're not doing it. And we'd say the phone is off. When the phone comes back on, we'll tell you. No, nope, ping it every 15 minutes. It turns out, as we found out after complaining about this, it was the sheriff's daughter who didn't come home from a date. How subject to abuse is this, right? And without any oversight, without any reporting, without any sunshine, uh, we have absolutely no way as a public of knowing whether or not these requests are legitimate. Now, for every one of those, there are 20 legitimate requests. So obviously, in kidnappings, in child uh, lost children, uh, everybody remembers probably the family that died in, uh, in Oregon in the mountains. The husband survived with his cell phone as he was climbing out, but the family died in their car in, in, in a snowstorm and, and couldn't get out. Uh, you know, to be able to save at least one life, uh, uh, it's, a, it's obviously a great service that, that carriers provide. But it is also subject to abuse without appropriate safeguards. And lastly, uh, there's a target versus associate problem that has to be solved. It's one thing to say, I have uh, an interest in you as the target, the su subject of surveillance to know where you are, but what about all the people that that target talks to? It's very current today to get the community of interest records of everybody the target talks to. And that may be an appropriate step for investigation to understand who's involved. But now they routinely include location requests as well. So that's a very burdensome thing to do. And it's questionable how you could ever know, even on the specific and articulable fact standard, that somebody in the future that somebody might call is relevant to an investigation. So the standard doesn't quite meet the practice today. That needs to be fixed in any legislation. And, and lastly, I'll just say uh, uh, two things that apply both in criminal and civil. If the service provider is offering these location-based services, uh, can civil parties track somebody who's using the service? Now, I had an order recently from a state court uh, you'll, you'll love it. it, it's a hilarious case, where the, uh, uh, you can be a private attorney general, in essence, when you're looking for counterfeit goods. The statutes permit you to go after somebody and exercise much of the same authority that law enforcement can have in making a, uh, 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 in requesting information on an expedited basis. And the creative lawyer asked us, because a cell phone was found on the, on the uh, uh, premises of a seized cargo container that contained, yes, counterfeit condoms, <coughs> which, which I suppose could be a public emergency, uh, to track that phone and all the phone numbers that were obtained uh, related to who called it. Now, we refuse because we still think that's tracking electronic surveillance that would only the government could do. But we don't have a law that precisely states that. So who's taken up that bail bondsman? We get requests all the time for bail bondsmen to track uh, uh, individuals. Guess what? Family law court. It's very common. My husband stole my kid. 
uh, didn't have the kid back on time. Where, is the, where are they now? I want the sheriff to go get them. And some states are looking for mandatory disclosure of location information in emergency situations, which may well include a child who wasn't brought back on time from uh, a shared parental uh, uh, oversight. So, you know, the risk is enormous that location information will be abused, misused, both in civil, in, in business, and in criminal cases. And uh, it's far from clear what Congress will do with this hot potato when it lands in their lap, but we do know it's coming, and it is going to be there. The courts, uh, uh, the development of this law through the courts is very inefficient, and, and uh, it, it makes very little sense for uh, uh, one user in a state to have their privacy safeguarded at a higher standard and another user not. And indeed, the same user perhaps subject to two inconsistent standards depending on which magistrate signed which order. And so your location may be provided on a lower standard on one wiretap and on a higher standard on another. So with, uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and uh, explain anything I've said. I know that's a lot of information in a short period of time, but I hope uh, it made some sense. Questions? Yes. In the difference between sort of specific individual information, which you were talking about here, and aggregate information. So you mentioned in passing Departments of Transportation, for instance, wanting uh, essentially a wide swath of information so they can essentially determine the flow of traffic. What are the sort of privacy implications associated with that? If a telco, for instance, is doing a, a high degree of anonymizing, what are the concerns mm -hmm. there? And are there parties other than government parties who could request access for that information? How would, how would you want to see that handled? Yeah, great question. And um, for wireless carriers, uh, we drafted and published uh, last spring a set of location-based services guidelines. You can find them on CTIA's website, which explains the standards that wireless carriers all signed up to for third parties to get access to individualized and aggregate location information. Uh, basically, carriers want the customer's consent to disclose location. And, you know, that raises an interesting question because who's the customer? Uh, many people buy five phones for their family, and there's one customer and five mm -hmm. users. Can the parent consent to track their child? Sure. Can the husband provide the service to their wife? and watch where she's going surreptitiously. Interesting. Unclear. Mm -hmm. But the customer must consent to it. For aggregate information, the carriers historically, because uh, of the Telecommunications Act actually treats location information derived from a telephone call to be something called CPNI, or Customer Proprietary Network Information under 47 USC 222. It requires the express consent of the user to disclose, except if you wish to make it into aggregate information, you may do so without that consent. So carriers develop security procedures to anonymize that information and then make it available to service providers like departments of transportation or third-party aggregators uh, to develop applications. So a mobile advertising application mm -hmm. could be based on all individuals registered on a particular cell tower at a time where you wouldn't know who those individuals were, yep. but you could broadcast an amber alert, for example, to, to everybody. Uh, that would be the use of, of also of aggregate information. Um, because non-carriers are not covered by that same prohibition in Section 222, uh, there are no standards that apply to them for the creation of aggregate information or the use of individualized information. So the Google Maps location server could be licensed to third parties for their applications. Now, all of those providers, like Google, recognize the extreme privacy sensitivity of it and therefore want consent and clear guidelines on the use of that information. That's a self-regulatory imposed regime. Should it be a legal standard? 
a very good question because the profiles created by these services ultimately are extremely revealing and, and, and sensitive uh, because we are getting close to the degree of accuracy that is much more granular than uh, a, a particular cell tower serving you, which can cover seven miles in some rural areas. We're talking about for 911 services an XYZ access. What floor in the building are you on? So if we're going to be that close and we'll be able to put you on the steps of uh, an AIDS treatment center or a mosque, we probably wish and should have a better standard on the use of that kind of granular information. Yes. I could sort of a follow up. Um, the CTNI right now is, uh, there's a little, <coughs> a little kerfuffle about this yesterday with Verizon. It, it defaults to the user gives permission. And this is, even though I'm sure the carriers are following the letter of the law, nobody knows about that. I mean, it's buried on the page. You have to know what you're looking for. They send out a little legalistic form. It's a default, it's a, it's a default that is rarely going to be. Uh, what do you think about that? Shouldn't we flip that? Uh, yeah, a, a poor journalism is what I think about it. The, the rules are actually much more restrictive than the article explained or, uh, uh, or people understood the opt-out notice uh, uh, to cover. So essentially, for basic CPNI, your calling records, the carrier can use it for its own marketing purposes, its own marketing purposes. But in order to share it with a third party, it requires opt-in consent of the user. The opt-out consent that you get is, is for their use of it, for their own marketing purposes, to tell you about their latest new feature or phone, not to give it to an airline to market frequent flyer services to you or to give it to an advertising company for their purposes. The legal definition of, <clears throat> since they can share it with their parent or affiliates, What's the legal definition of affiliate here? How protected are we from them that, saying that mm -hmm. some offender is, is an affiliate? That, that, that's correct. So they can share it in the family. So Verizon could give it to long distance, and it's, it's whoever you own or control. And, of course, telcos don't own or control marketing companies, for example, or billing companies, uh, at least currently. So within the family of companies, all of Ver and I don't represent Verizon just as a disclaimer here, uh, uh, within the family of uh, companies, a carrier can share information for marketing, and you have the option to opt out of receiving a notice from Verizon Long Distance or their FIO service or broadband service, for example. But they can't give it to an independent contractor, and they can't for marketing purposes or, uh, or a vendor uh, for that purpose. And, and, and CP&I has a higher standard for location. So in any event, that notice does not cover location, which requires your express opt-in to use. I'm sorry, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I just want to just try, because this is an incredibly good opportunity, mm -hmm. and so I want to push. The language, at least the language that is given to mere end users is, it's for parent companies or affiliates. Mm -hmm. What is, is there a legal definition of affiliate? What is? Sure. The, the Federal Communications Commission's rules contain a, a definition of affiliate that is an entity which you own or control. And ownership or control is a, you know, a legal concept of, of you know, 51% ownership or stock control, and it's kind of a historical uh, definition. So it's within the family of companies that are commonly owned or controlled. So that would exclude independent contractors, vendors, third parties that are not within the family of ownership. And, 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 you know, Verizon obviously would do better to say all of the Verizon companies instead of to use the legal term. And those companies, because carriers are independently incorporated in individualized states, that's what they're getting at. So Verizon of New Mexico could obtain and use the CP&I from Verizon Wireless to offer you local service, to offer you local broadband service. That would be permitted. Thank you. Make sense? Yep. You too. Um, I'm Ladies. interested in some of the technical aspects and also the mass privacy laws. So um, I think you mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, that a, a consortium was put together a while back of um, technical individuals from some of the companies to help develop the standards. 
because this area technically is constantly evolving, is there, did that consortium of technical advisors, um, has that remained current and is it still actively advising on developments? Yeah, great question. Um, so the industry standard was developed under TIA, the Telecommunications Industry Association, and uh, they produced Joint Standard 25, which was the basic core cellular and wireline standard. Uh, they had to meet again to do Joint Standard 25A, which added what we described as the punch list features after the court in 2000 determined law enforcement was entitled to a couple more things. We put those in. We reconvened to do Joint Standard 25B to address packet mode communications when the FCC extended CALEA to broadband internet access. So it isn't a standing committee in the sense that they meet regularly to look at network evolution, but rather based on new legal requirements that come out, they do meet and, and address those. The packet mode communications standard uh, had a particularly sordid history. That standard has been challenged by law enforcement as uh, insufficient to meet their needs and currently is pending before the FCC for decision. Uh, it's been there for three years. So presently we have no packet mode interception standard in place. Essentially the carriers wanted to only provide uh, information about the user at the beginning and end of a session. Law enforcement wanted everything in between. So that's the gulf that separates the industry and uh, 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 law enforcement today. The downside of that is nothing prevents law enforcement in the meantime from bringing their equipment into the premises to do their interception work. And that's a problem for many carriers. Federal regulations or the California regulations, and it's kind of a, a growing area where people are advising as well. Have you been involved in that, and do you have any comments on that? On mass privacy laws? Yeah, Massachusetts. There's uh, oh yeah, the data, data identity yeah. theft. And, uh, yeah, I, I I love I love how one state basically ratchets up, uh, you know, but but obviously it only applies if you have Massachusetts uh, residents in your database, right? So. Uh, do That's companies true, although it's so difficult to know if you have Massachusetts residents in your databases that it's been found that for all practical purposes it can almost apply to everybody in the United States and also because of ways you can interpret where that data is stored and who owns it it may not be mass residents but if you're using EMC storage devices that might be located in Holliston are you covered by mass data privacy laws it can be interpreted to almost mean everyone in the world yeah and and of course uh, it's not limited to a, a telco or a service provider. It's limited to anybody. It, it's not limited. It's anybody that stores the data on a mass reg uh, 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 in resident. Um, you know, it's a lot like the European Privacy Directive. Uh, one can pronounce all they want, but if they don't have jurisdiction over you at the end of the day, if you're not doing business in that state, if they don't have enforcement over you, then it's an interesting pronouncement that in practice will be compartmentalized and routed around as opposed to implemented. I think that there's a lot of reaction to it, which is why it keeps getting delayed time and again and revised time and again. Uh, the principles of it are pretty good, right? I mean, if we had uh, better security and, and uh, uh, encryption standards and the like, uh, we'd all have more privacy. But I, I seriously doubt that Massachusetts will be the rule at the end of the day, unlike California, which really set the standard for security breach notice that now is in, you know, 44 states mm -hmm. and, you know, the base, basis of discussion for federal law on it. Yes? I wonder if you can say something about <clears throat> how the, how user perceptions of privacy might affect this in the future. So, for example, um, as, as more and more people elect to have their location, um, you know, recognized by, by Google or Loop or any of these other location-aware social systems, um, those, those, their perceptions of, or rather their expectations of privacy, of course, are different as they're, as they're personally disclosing this stuff. And I think about something like, you know, Gmail, that, um, where somehow it's okay that, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that Google would sort of parse our, our content, and, and as you say, location is content, which I think is very interesting. 
um, that Google would parse our content and then and sort of deliver us advertising. Well, of course, that's the business model for things like Latitude and Luke. Eventually, mm -hmm. that uh, in the sort of minority report model of uh, of uh, the world, that that in fact, you know, our location will determine how we're being advertised to. So, so at what point does and I know that those are third parties, but at what point do those expectations now um, interact with what you're talking? Yeah, it, it's a, a, a great question, and uh, I have a personal view and then and a legal view as well. Uh, in a case called U.S. v. Warshak, W-A-R-S-C-H-A-K, I think that is, in the Sixth, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, the government argued that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to users who have agreed in the terms and conditions and privacy policy of online sites to the review, access, and use of their personal information for advertising and other purposes. And <laughs> so if there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in what everybody else is looking at, and if I give it to Gmail or somebody else to insert advertising, then what the heck? How can you complain? and say that the Constitution protects me when I'm letting a machine or some other person look at it. Um, the judge dismissed that notion in the district court opinion and said, uh, this doesn't apply to mechanical insertion of ads, review mechanically for spam <coughs> and viruses. But, you know, intellectually, it's really hard to make that argument, I think. So... Uh, where the Fourth Amendment might not apply, and you may lose a reasonable expectation of privacy because you are uh, the equivalent of a digital skin flint and think everything belongs on Facebook, or anyone can look at stuff to give you that free service in return for serving ads to you. That doesn't mean as a matter of policy that the law should have a lower standard. And the Stored Communications Act and the Electronic Communications Act are intended to fill voids in the Fourth Amendment and to produce a policy decision on what standard the government should follow to get access. So even though I'm willing to let you look at it, or I have, like, you know, my son, uh, 800 friends on Facebook, uh, that doesn't mean I'm willing to let the government look at it, or I should be able to let them have access to it on uh, a, a mere subpoena without judicial oversight. Should it be probable cause is the question. And that's the question, I think, that will consume Congress in the coming session for all of these sorts of network, uh, social networks. Uh, uh, as everything moves wireless, we've added mobility as uh, an attribute that is much more revealing even than the content itself. And we have yet to address from a legal standpoint, I think, holistically, which standard should apply to that. And I go back to what I said at the outset. I think there are really three categories here. The historical, although even that is subject to privacy and intrusiveness and concerns. The real time, where am I uh, right now? And then the prospective, which is, you know, where am I going over a period of time? And uh, it may turn out that there are three different standards that are appropriate for those circumstances. But as I said, you know, the government is very good at heuristics. They look at the historical record and determine where you're going from that next time. Who else is good at heuristics? Insurance companies. If I know the route you take every day going to work in your car, maybe I give you a cheaper rate. Do we want redlining based on your location profile? Do we want the insurance company to require you to disclose your location? in order to make determinations on what rate is appropriate to you. I mean, we have a, we have a whole raft of these issues ahead of us uh, that we've only just now started to, to, to really think through, and uh, I'm not sure where, where we're going to end up with that one. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I just want to get the simplest pieces of this and clear in my mind. So a pen register is a record of the numbers I dialed? In real time. You're dialing time. or signaling in real time. Okay. And so, and that's easy to get. If somebody just asks, we want the pen register of what this guy dialed. Yes. That turns out to be easier. 
And then in terms of locating, if somebody wants to know exactly where this is, do they triangulate it from three cell towers or is it a GPS? How do they know I'm at 23 Everett Street? Okay. There are multiple ways and it depends on the carrier. Some carriers have built tools to ping a phone based solely on triangulation within their network because this is a radio. It's just sending out a signal and it's registering on every tower. The tower picks the strongest signal to carry the call but all the towers still know where you are. So by simply analyzing the time of delivery of the signal, I can triangulate your precise performance. Okay. Some carriers have built that in. Others have not and can only tell law enforcement where the tower is and which face of the tower it's on. So I can look at a quarter of a circle and know you're in that direction. GPS is very different. And as long as I have a clear signal, I can triangulate because GPS is based on the same concept, uh, three satellites visible at any time, measuring the time of delivery of the signal between the three. So uh, th there also is a hybrid called network-assisted GPS where I take both the GPS signal and the network signal and mash them up to come out with it. So that's how they determine it. So there are two different, there are two different ways to do triangulation, mm -hmm. satellite triangulation and cell tower triangulation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this has to have a GPS GPS enabled before they could do the former. Correct. Okay. Can I ask like, a question before you go to Ethan? So, um, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the wire, and I, I know that some, maybe some other people in this room are fans of the show. And, <laughs> you know, I, I don't follow the advice of the drug dealers in that show, but I, I'm intrigued <laughs> by, by, the, by the use of, of what we would, I guess, call um, operational security by these very intelligent drug dealers, and, and one of the techniques that the characters in the show use is what they what they call burners, which are prepaid cell phones that they don't actually ever refill. They buy a, a thirty dollar phone at Seven Eleven, use it for a couple of days, and then throw it away. And I'm wondering if you can speak just for a couple of minutes on on how this shift to uh, essentially disposable phones purchased in cash has changed uh, what, what what normally would be the status quo. Um, may, maybe made life easier or maybe made life more difficult and and particularly I guess one thing I want to focus in on is the fact that you know no matter if you change your phone every week if you're still calling your mom on her fixed line phone you're, you're, you're linkable and I was wondering yep. if you can just talk yep. a little that's bit about the community that. of interest right. uh, so long as they know you're calling your mom and are able to get a wiretap up right. quickly uh, re remember in uh, you may not know this but the wiretap law has something called a roving wiretap which allows the government to dispense with the ordinary procedures when they know the individual is trying to evade surveillance. So it used to be set up for purposes of phone booths where you could rapidly go and get an order on a new phone booth and the, government and the carrier would have to put it up. Now it's being used for disposable cell phones because, you know, obviously they walk in, buy a new one, and then you need the number. Um, the UK has just uh, uh, prosecuted or, or intended to prosecute, I, as I understand it, somebody who failed to register their prepaid cell phone. So in the UK, they have a requirement that if you buy prepaid, you still have to register that phone so they know who you are. Uh, 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 you know, there are probably a million uh, Mickey Mouses in the UK right now uh, using uh, that registration service. Uh, not too hard to have a fake ID to do that besides, but anyway, it's, it's law enforcement's attempt to solve a problem, which is a very serious problem for them. Uh, but prepaid does not mean non-wiretappable. Uh, there still is a vendor. That vendor still has a platform. That platform still records the dialing and signaling in order to complete the call. So if I have the information someplace, I can get that information. A wireless phone still must register on a network. That network still must be paid for that call. And so there is a means to debit that prepaid account. So the only issue is whether it's rapid enough to capture it in real time and get the carrier's assistance to do it. And, and actually, um, prepaid has not been as big a problem as Wired and 24 and some of those other shows would, would lead you to believe. Which is good because we want the criminals to, to think that they're more secure. It's the good guys we don't want to 
Yeah, yeah. So my question is going to go, and it's going to take you out of your comfort zone because my work is mostly with human rights activists and repressive nations. So it's routine for me to go into a meeting with someone in Cairo, and we will all then disassemble our cell phones, and depending on your level of paranoia, that can be the SIM card and the battery, or yeah. I've seen people go even further than that. My question is basically this. When we had the debate in the U.S. over Clipper all these years ago, one of the more compelling arguments, I thought, came from Patrick Ball, who's a major human rights and technology advocate, who said, I don't care how much we trust the U.S. government, I don't care how many safeguards we have in place, we're going to build these backdoors into telecoms equipment, that equipment is going to get exported around the world, and it's going to go to governments where we know those safeguards aren't in place. And so even if we have a really terrific functional key escrow system, you bring it into Zimbabwe and that's just not going to happen. It's simply the back door that lets us in. Is that getting discussed at all at the standards level associated with this? When we're building these standards, we have a tendency to export them whether we wish to or not. We're exporting them into extremely different legal environments. What are the implications of that and is that being discussed at all at the standard setting level? Um. Yeah, I mean, the, the standards are developed by manufacturers who distribute their equipment to multiple markets, and the standards comply with whatever the local law demands are. They try not to build for 270 countries. They would prefer to build for one country, one nation, one globe. But inevitably, there are additional uh, requirements that are baked in for depending on, you know, whether you're selling into China or whether you're selling into someplace else. But, but you know, also don't forget repressive regimes control the access points. And so I don't really need the manufacturer to do anything if everything going in and out of a country floats through the pipe that I own. And, you know, of course, that's how we deal with places. You know, that's how, you know, China and other places deal with, with uh, uh, those problems uh, as well. So, you know, I, don't, I think you could have standards all you want on it. Uh, the access ports are the big issue. And that, that's not really true. I mean, it's particularly untrue in the China case, right? I mean, if you actually were to monitor all Internet traffic coming in and out of China, where there's simply no equipment that's capable of doing it at that point. The Great Firewall, based on the research we've been doing for five years here, is now mostly at a provider level, which is to say either at the ISP level or even more than that at the publishing platform level. Sure. So the actual technology has enormous implications, and, and what that ISP, yeah. for instance, is capable of doing ha has enormous implications. Yeah, I, I don't agree with you there. I, I, I think that, that, that you're, you're right that the path of least resistance is often followed by the service provider wishing to enter that market. And in order to get permission to enter, uh, they will sometimes uh, block IP addresses, have takedown, uh, requirements. But look, that's the criminal law of that country. If I can't uh, uh, say anything bad about the, the uh, uh, head of India's government or the head of Turkey's government, uh, and if I do say something bad, I'm going to go to jail, and if I host that, I'm going to go to jail, well, service providers aren't going to host the illegal mm -hmm. thing, even if it's Nazi memorabilia, right? So, so you end up with compromises made by service providers, but the ultimate firewall is the access port at the end of the day because I could simply turn it off. Mm -hmm. And the, everything in between is a compromise which lets something in or something out. And it's really not the standards that are getting there. I will say this, however, and, and I think inevitably the internet from a technological point of view is breaking down based on volume. And, and the quality control means of solving that problem are manufacturers building in quality of service capabilities to their equipment, which has the effect of doing what? <laughs> you know, regulating traffic, mm -hmm. ports, applications, uh, just follow the Comcast issue with uh, uh, regulating peer-to-peer -peer communications, and, and you'll see. So even though those standards are not intended for surveillance, they have the practical application mm -hmm. of being able to identify and isolate on a protocol level certain communications. And so it, by default, I'm creating a system for the Internet which is going to make surveillance and or firewalling a lot easier. Yes? Relative to what Ian, or Ethan said, um, two thoughts. Where are we on global governance of commerce? address all of this because it all is interconnected and right now there is only one functional employer.
courts of the global court, the international criminal court, and the discussions are happening quietly, but I don't see the telecom stepping into this debate. And I haven't heard you address consequences for government, um, police, and the security authority, even if it's in the U.S., um, that might be implemented for misuse. Mm -hmm. So uh, the criminal, let me do it in reverse order. The criminal law is the criminal law, whether a uh, agent uh, improperly wiretaps or a civilian improperly wiretaps. All of you may have enjoyed the private investigator to the stars, Pelicano, going to jail for illegally wiretapping. He had an accomplice in a, uh, uh, inside of company that helped him illegally wiretap. Uh, who likewise goes to jail. Uh, the same applies to law enforcement agents. Uh, there was a, uh, a sheriff recently that uh, was sentenced to two years in prison for illegally wiretapping. We've had uh, DEA agents, uh, uh, two in particular in New York, sent to federal prison for illegally using subpoenas to get call records. Uh, I'll say this absolutely about while the government investigators are zealots and want to solve their case, uh, they are very sensitive to following the law. I've regularly had them say to me, uh, I don't want that because I'm not authorized to get it. And not all carriers or ISPs are particularly educated about what they can and can't do. There are uh, 3,500 uh, cell phone companies. No, I mean, you don't realize that, but there, there's tons of them. There are, are the equivalent number of ISPs in this country. They don't have uh, a skilled staff in dealing with this or for legal review. The Inspector General's report for national securities letters revealed that some ISPs were, were giving content out on administrative subpoena. They were giving email out when all they were asking for were uh, uh, the subscriber's name and address. So, you know, over collection uh, can occur. But, but generally speaking, investigators are uh, uh, very good at following the law, and I don't think we have a lot of, of effort on their part to go around it. Now, you can argue that different for the warrantless surveillance program and all of that issue. Uh, we could have a whole second debate about that one here. Uh, but I think, you know, generally speaking, uh, the enforcement and following the law, pretty good. And, and approving wiretaps, by the way. You know, we only do about uh, under 2,000 authorized wiretaps a year in this country. Compare that to uh, uh, Italy. I have a, a, a friend there who once laughed that his third divorce occurred because somebody wiretapped him as the chief of police in Rome, uh, and his wife found out about it. 360,000 a year. So compare us to Italy, to Germany, hundreds of thousands. I mean, the U.S. is actually punctilious about approving wiretaps, and I commend the Department of Justice for the process they follow there. On a global basis, however, all of the uh, discussion is about something different than wiretapping because state security is carved out of international treaties. We don't uh, turn our investigative needs over to global institutions. We do, however, work with countries on cross-border evidence gathering and have and this is where a very interesting debate is occurring globally right now. Uh, we have the uh, uh, Convention on Cybercrime, which requires those signatory countries to cooperate to deal with cross-border evidence gathering in uh, computers uh, uh, and databases stored in the U.S. Now, if I provide um, Gmail services or a social networking platform that's accessible by users in Greece. This is a little bit to your Massachusetts example. And uh, I have 20 million users in Greece. And the Greek government says, you know, there are, or, or better still, the Brazilian government where this is, is, is absolutely true, uh, most of your users are pedophiles and uh, skinheads. So we want that information and all of their email that goes with it. But my database is in the U.S., and under the Stored Communications Act, I can't disclose content to foreign law enforcement. I can give it to my government if they come to me, but now being a skinhead in Brazil is not a crime in the U.S., so I don't have a predicate 
in order to disclose that information. In emergency cases like the Mumbai bombing, our government works with their government to get emergency disclosure of content and uh, call identifying and communications identifying information. They work collaboratively in emergencies like that to address those issues. But for the routine criminal activity in a foreign country, we don't have a very good mechanism. And so what do they do? They arrest the executives in the country. You know, they, they beat on them to attempt to get the company to disclose it. And the companies are always walking a very fine line on how to do that. Uh, we have mutual legal assistance treaties, which we refer them to, and we get assistance from the Department of Justice to work with the local law enforcement to do it. But, you know, the best thing in the world for the future political career of a district attorney in an area in Brazil is to do what? Prosecute Google. <laughs> you know, take, take up the cudgels of, of the rights of the people. And, you know, this is around the world, and, and it's every service provider that has a globally accessible business. And uh, that's a big issue on the horizon. We don't have a good answer to it right now. We have time for one more question, and I'm going to give that to my boss. So, Rob? Good choice. Good choice, Chris. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I haven't thought in such stark terms of the difference before today of asking for the record of an individual versus asking for the record of all the individuals in a given area. Um, there was a, a, uh, a recent uh, example I can see the, the the food riots in Egypt, where it was the uh, disclosure recently that Vodafone had turned over the information on, on who was present there. What, what are the legal standards uh, for asking for information on people who are attending an event versus uh, getting getting information on an individual? Are they, are they pretty well defined, or are they up in the air and up for grabs? This just seems to me an area of very, very vulnerable to abuse. Definitely. I had a police chief in a small community in Michigan uh, say that there was a protest that they expected was going to be violent, and he wanted the location on all of the phones so that they could prepare to defend against the inevitable riot. Wow. It was a civil rights march. Uh, you know, obviously, the abuse is enormous. Uh, what's the standard? Uh, your guess is as good as mine because it's not clear. Let me give you a, a couple of very specific examples. Um, the, the law separates uh, uh, remote computing services into, well, there's a, a category called the remote computing service. And so if I store my documents online, put my photos online, then the government can get access to that under certain conditions. Now, they're actually very low standards to do that. But they can get access to that for me as a subscriber to that service. But what is uh, YouTube? Is it a remote computing service? I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the person that posted it, certainly. What about vis-a-vis -vis the person that watched it? If I get a request for every person that viewed a particular video that happened to be in Arabic, that happened to have an Al-Qaeda symbol in the background, which many do, which Senator Liebman took umbrage at, uh, what's the standard to get that? All persons registered on a cell site, what's the standard to get that? All persons that viewed a particular website, the content of it. When somebody asked, uh, when law enforcement asked in a, in a case in Wisconsin for all of the people who bought a particular book, Amazon.com, uh, moved to quash that, and on First Amendment grounds, the district court agreed that that would reveal too much in order for them to go fish, essentially, in order to develop witnesses for their defrauding scheme that they were looking for relative to that particular book. Uh, the standards are absolutely unclear, and we as a people now rely on service providers to make those objections in the first instance. Because it's not even clear you would have standing to object to that request. In many states, the individual uh, record holder doesn't have standing to object to a third party subpoena. New Jersey, for example. So who can object? Well, the carrier objects. On what grounds? It's burdensome. And that's really basically where we are today, if not for the service providers then that information would go. 
and I, I have to say that most service providers are very concerned because their business rests on your comfort level with their protection of your privacy. You won't use it if you're not safe. And so most of them stand up like Google did to the Department of Justice subpoena for search. And I think that's a great thing. But not it's not uniform and it's not a uniform reaction and the standards just are not clear. Uh, they should be. <laughs> With a hammer. <laughs> With a hammer. <laughs> Absolutely. On that note, let's... Uh, Thank you. Pleasure. My email.